Hey, today's guest on the podcast has had a lot of negative pushback on social media because she's sharing her story as an ex-porn star who joined the Catholic Church. Some people say, hey, she just she just live a life of private reparation and shame. She shouldn't be given a stage and a platform. It's just scandalous. I don't know. I kind of disagree. I think the world needs to hear these stories uh, for the sake of those who are consumed in the porn industry or consumed by it. Uh, they need to hear that light is possible, conversion can happen, and all things can be made new in Christ. Before we have Bree join us on the show here in a second, I first want to make sure you guys know about RestoredMinistry.com. Restored is an incredible apostolate, brand new in the Catholic Church, that helps people that are coming from broken families not to repeat the cycles of brokenness that they've witnessed in their own parents' failed relationship. Because a lot of people give up on marriage because they think, well, I don't want it to turn out like my parents did, but they don't have the tools to have a successful relationship. So at Restored, they have those tools. They've got a wonderful podcast. They've got books, resources. Joey Pontarelli, who's behind the whole thing, is just an incredible soul, a great friend here at Chastity Project and supporter of what we're doing. And we just want to make sure that you're checking out the work that they're doing over there at uh, RestoredMinistry.com. Check out the podcast. Check out the books. If you want to build the family that you never got to have growing up in, this is going to be the resource to help you to do that. Also want to just thank all those of our community members at Patreon who make this all possible. Um, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Uh, you're such a blessing to myself, to our family. And if you would want to come alongside in our community, those who are not patrons yet, you just go to patreon.com slash Jason Everett, and then you can help support this show with the engineering of it and the productions, the lights, the cameras, our family, all that goes to support that we're doing here. Just click on the link in the show notes uh, to Patreon if you want to support us. In the meantime, I know you're going to enjoy this episode with Bree Solstad. Uh, she is a courageous woman, bold in sharing her faith and about the, the victory that God has accomplished in her and in her life. And so open your heart, open your mind, share this with other people so people can discover that God indeed can make all things new. Bree, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. I remember watching on my RCI videos, and it's just surreal talking to you now. I feel like a fangirl. I'm just so excited. <laughs> oh, well, no, it's a joy and a gift to have you on here and your witness. I know sometimes people who have checkered past come into the church and some people are given kind of a rather unwarm welcome, uh, kind of like uh, the first people they meet are the prodigal son's brother of just like, what, you're back? Oh, come on, get out of here. You know, and so yeah. I'm, I'm sorry if you've received a chilly reception, you won't get one here. So we are very glad and honored to have you on the program. And a lot of times when I interview folks, um, I kind of, well, tell me the beginning and then, then, then what happened and where'd you come from? I thought today, maybe let's Let's just dive right into like the, the depths of the middle of everything. What I mean is I want to invite you to maybe share with us, if you're comfortable, of, of a moment when you were in the middle of everything in this industry. Like, let's say you spent the day filming or whatever, and then you got home, I don't know, to your house, apartment or whatever, and, uh, and you were alone, you know, maybe going to sleep at night with your thoughts, with your fears, um, you know, could you share with us just a moment of, of what, where you were at at that time, where God was at? in that moment of, of just darkness and perhaps feeling trapped or afraid, you know, I, I know we're kind of fast forwarding right into the middle of the story, mm -hmm. but you know, is, is there any moment that really sticks out to you of just a, a, alone with God in the darkness in the midst of all this? Definitely. And, um, oddly enough, it, it's not because of my past. It's actually something that occurred about three years ago. Something happened to me and it was the, greatest tragedy of my life. It was a horrific accident that couldn't have necessarily been controlled. And um, I think of it as the worst thing that could possibly have happened. And I still truly believe that. And that evening, I was running around outside, just desperate for God to take this from me. And I remember falling down on my knees and just staying there, staying down on my knees and holding my hands so tightly that I still remember the whiteness of my knuckles and praying, please, please don't let this happen. Please, God, don't, don't do this. And he did. He let it happen. He did it. And that next day, I thought to myself, all right, you know what? If you're going to turn your back on me, then I'm going to turn my back on you. And I had been raised in the church. I had what I thought was a pretty good relationship with God, but 
now looking back on it, it was more just um, I would speak to him and um, kind of try to develop this relationship with him when I needed something, you know, when it was convenient for me. It wasn't about gratitude. It wasn't an exchange. Um, it was just primarily, what can you give me? And so even though our relationship wasn't super tight, I thought, you know what, even the little amount that you are in my heart, I'm going to totally expunge you because of what you did. And I went for about three years like that. Um, you know, that when that occurred, I thought to myself, um, I really considered suicide. Um, I thought that was the only way that I would be able to kind of live with myself is just to end it all. And um, I went into therapy, you know, I saw a therapist once a week, and it was getting a little bit better. But for me, it was just something that I was going to have to live with. Like, this is how my life is going to be from now on. And I don't want to have anything to do with God. Um, I remember within those few years, I did go to church once and I just cried hysterically the whole time because I, I couldn't talk to him. I was so mad at him and so confused of like, why would you do this to me? Why did you do this? Why would you let this happen? And, um, and I remember, yeah, I went to church once and just crying hysterically. I, I, I couldn't even get through the whole service. I had to excuse myself several times because just like being in his presence in his house, um, I, I was so uncomfortable with that because I was so mad at him. And I went through life like that for a few years. And um, then something kind of profound happened. Um, and it's funny, I think a lot of people want my story to be like, I used to produce porn. Now this profound thing happened and now I don't produce porn anymore. And and that is my story, but the fact that I gave up pornography and instead consecrated myself to him and to our mother really was just the fruits of what occurred. And um, about a year ago, so not this past spring, but the spring before, I had an opportunity to go to Italy. And so I thought, yeah, I'll take it. Um, and I spent about six months preparing and realized that the greatest artwork in all of Western civilization is found in, primarily in Rome. And all of those pieces of art are found primarily in churches and basilicas. And I didn't really think of it as God's house necessarily. I was really excited to go into all these places and see all this art because it's, you know, well-known artists. I didn't really think of it as a house of God necessarily. It was more like I was going into a museum and appreciating the art for its beauty. And then slowly, it, it didn't even take that long. It was maybe like the third day, something kind of started to change in me. And every time I'd walk into these churches, these basilicas, I noticed that the crucifix is right there on display. And I was raised Lutheran. And Lutherans, I think, are kind of almost embarrassed of the crucifix. It's never on display. Mm. So I notice this right off and think, you know, there's Jesus's greatest gift to us right here on display for me. But still, I was so mad at him. I didn't want to have anything to do with him. But slowly but surely, I started kind of appreciating the art for artwork for more than just beauty. I started appreciating it for the theology or for what it represented. And then another really significant thing is I started seeing Mary um, everywhere. And to the point where I almost questioned, I was like, is this woman stalking me? Like she's in all the churches. She's in, you know, in every cafe that we go into. She was on my, on a barista's bracelet. She's on like little side panels, you know, up um, on a street corner. And I, being Lutheran, I didn't have much of a relationship to Mary. But having gone through this tragedy and being so mad at God, I wasn't able to speak to him at this point. Mm -hmm. But something told me that I could speak to Mary. And initially, I just kind of introduced myself and like, hi, you know, uh, do you speak English? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Um, and and then I started to talk to her and communicate with her and realized that she truly is such an epitome of grace and beauty 
and tragedy. She went through a tragedy that doesn't compare to any of ours. And yet she went through it with grace and with dignity. And I started to consider, well, maybe I could be a little bit more like that. And these are just like seeds of thought going through. And I'm still really struggling um, within my own life and within this tragedy specifically. And then from there, from Rome, um, I went to Assisi. And I admit I went to Assisi primarily to hang out with and learn more about St. Francis. Um, I'm a big fan of animals. And Mm -hmm. I joke that St. Francis is kind of like a gateway saint. You know, even non-Catholics have like a statue of him in their garden or something. And um, and now I say, you know, go to Assisi for St. Francis, but stay for St. Clair. Yeah, yeah. I went to visit her tomb and I had learned a little bit about her in my research, but not that much. And nothing prepared me for what happened. I went to her tomb. I knelt in front of her. I closed my eyes and I'm not, I'm not going to say that I'm some sort of mystic or anything like that, but she appeared to me. I closed my eyes and she appeared before me. She was dressed in like an off-white gown with gold threads running through it. Her face was totally obscured in light. Um, And she spoke to me and she said, you can put her here. She said, I remember it distinctly. She gestured to her lap and she said, do you see how soft my lap is? Look at how soft my forearms are. You can put her here and I'll take her. And I took that to mean my tragedy, that she wouldn't, that she would help me, that she would take some of this off of my shoulder. And I'm just weeping hysterically at this point. But I I don't really think much of it because I wasn't raised in the Catholic Church. I'm not sure about how these things work. Maybe it's all in my mind, you know. And I've since thought about it, and there's no way it could have just been in my mind because I would have pictured her completely different. And the thing about the forearms, that's just too weird for me to have come up with on my own. Mm -hmm. Um, I leave her tomb, and um, and I don't even mention it to anybody else. Like I I know that we're going to go back into the daylight, back with our tour guide. So I'm like trying to fix my face, you know, and like everything's okay, and. And then I get home and I start to examine my life and I start to really miss those feelings that I had gotten in Italy, being closer to Mary, being introduced to St. Clair. And I really wanted that. And I wasn't yet ready to admit it to myself necessarily, but I knew the only place that I could get those feelings again would be a Catholic church. And if for no other reason than just to rekindle those feelings, I started going to mass. And um, and every now and then, you know, the homily would include something about pornography or something about, you know, living entirely in this world and yourself being the center of attention and even still, I was I was somewhat resistant because I was like, well, they don't really know what they're talking about. And then I heard it a couple more times to the point where it made me like feel really awkward. And, and like, do other people know that I'm in pornography and he's talking about me? And so this starts to settle in and I start to consider that well, I don't like who I am. I don't like what I'm doing. Um, I don't like manipulating men for money. I don't, I don't like being just completely emotional all the time. And so I decide to, I make an appointment with and talk with a priest because, you know, there are people in my life who are like, yeah, yeah, uh uh-huh. I totally agree, but I'm not going to listen to them. I want it from an authority. Yeah. So I make an appointment with a priest. I go to talk with him and he doesn't really ask me anything about my past. He doesn't really ask me about growing up Lutheran or what brought me here or anything. He just simply asks me, um, what is your faith like? And I open my mouth and it's just word vomit like all over his desk. And I'm crying hysterically. I'm telling him about who I was before the tragedy, after the tragedy. I'm so mad at God and all of this. 
And he says many incredible things to me, but the two things that have stuck with me and really made the greatest impact were God loves you and he doesn't want you to be unhappy. And that blew me away. It's not that I forgot that God loved me, but something about the way that he said it in those moments struck me to my core. And I think that he could have said, God wants you to be happy, and it wouldn't have made as much of an impact. I know it's pretty much the same thing, but the fact that he said, God doesn't want you to be unhappy really struck me. Hmm. And prior to meeting with him, I spoke with his secretary for a few minutes because I arrived early and um, because I was kind of nervous. And his secretary told me within the five minutes of just meeting her, she told me about how, about a great tragedy that occurred in her life and her son had committed suicide. And I thought, my gosh, like this woman, like now that's tragedy. That's horrific. And And yet she still is here, loving God, appreciating this glorious universe. I want that. Mm -hmm. And so I I spoke with a priest. Um, I come out. He he introduces me to his secretary. I'm like, yeah, we're good friends. Um, And he explains that his secretary is actually one of the instructors for RCIA. And so immediately at that point, I was like, no doubt in my mind whatsoever. Sign me up. I'm ready. And, um, and then from there, you know, I realized I can't have it both ways. I can't live this life. That's me centered. I can't continue producing pornography and be Catholic at the same time. I have to choose one or the other. And so I was a little nervous just because, um, you know, after, after you're in kind of a taboo industry for 10 years, what are you going to do after that? You know? Uh, what would you put on your resume? Like, how am I going to get a job? But I thought, I'm I'm just going to go for it and trust in the Lord. And it was one of the best decisions that I ever made. Um, truly, there's no looking back. And I was, like I said, I was a little bit nervous about the whole money thing, but um, things have come my way that I couldn't have ever expected. Um, just graces and forgiveness and love. And if you look on social media, there is a lot of uh, people who are, I don't know, kind of unsupportive, uncharitable. Um, but for, but that we all have to remember that social media is just a very loud, small percentage. Um, the amount of people that I've met at, who are just so welcoming and just so supportive and who support and love and welcome me, not like in spite of my past, but almost because of it. Um, Mm. I truly feel, yeah, like the prodigal son and the amount of support has just been overwhelming to this day. Like I get goosebumps thinking about it. Um, It's just been incredible. And I never thought that I would end up here in the Catholic church, but I'm so grateful. And I know that really, this is where I was destined to be all along. Yeah, and, and I, I apologize again on behalf of anyone in the church that's given oh. you that chilly reception. Just <laughs> I, You know, I don't know what it is in your story that makes them insecure, or I don't, I don't know what it is that make them lash out to you and be like, well, you need to be a little hermit, you know, and you should just go live in the desert and wear sackcloth and ashes. Because mm-hmm. you <laughs> yeah, yeah. you've got a bad past, and the rest of us Catholics are just squeaky clean. It's just like... Right. I mean, how out of touch of reality can you possibly be? So, um, but you were mentioning just the, the, the fear, because I think fear traps us in sins and fear traps us in situations that God didn't have planned for us in the first place. And the devil just kind of really pours in the fear, the discouragement of like, hey, I'm making you feel like God's just going to bring out in the wilderness and just starve you to death. You know, he's going to have you walk in the Red mm-hmm. Sea and the whole thing's just going to drown you. So why don't you stay? Just don't move. Just stay still. You've got things under control. You've got this. At least if you keep the status quo, 
you know, then, you know, at least you're, you you don't have to walk into that uncertainty because that's that's a dark place to go. And so it almost seems like scary. trust yeah. is the one thing the evil one wants you not to experience. So h- how did you confront that fear of like, am I going to end up homeless? Am I going to have some crazy guys coming after me because I'm not showing up at the set anymore to produce this? And I've got contracts and I've got people waiting on me. What did you do in those moments of fear when you were tempted to go back to the life that you had only known before? Um, primarily I just, I just put all of my faith in him and, um, I didn't really have that much trepidation after I decided, you know, it was January 1st of this year. I put out a post on Twitter saying that I'm quitting. I'm quitting the industry. I found God. I, and I'm, I'm just giving up everything, all of my income and shutting down all of my stores. And to this day, yeah, I still get messages of previous clients who are like, I really miss you. Why don't you come back? And I don't know, kind of weird. Um, but I I don't feel any obligation to them. Um, mm. I feel an obligation to Mary, to St. Clair. And um, most people, I think when they quit pornography they just kind of um like fade out or you know they'll make they'll make an announcement saying that they're retiring but I felt like I was given such a gift that I can't keep it to myself Mm -hmm. and and I've since learned um also really what it means to be a witness and to inspire others I I never thought that I could be somebody who would inspire someone, you know, within the faith, um, I still think of myself as, you know, as a somewhat disgusting sinner. We all are, you know? Um, and, and so I think really the only thing that made me hesitate was, um, how am I going to live on, on such a modest income? And then I realized like, that's not, my concern, really. Um, I know that he's going to take care of me. And maybe that means that, you know, I'll have to sell off like my fancy shoes or um, like photography equipment or, you know, for like, we didn't take vacations for a while. um, But that's fine. And, um, and I, I would much rather live with less knowing that I am his and he is mine than have an extravagant vacation life with fancy shoes and all the latest technology and be separate from him. Like Mm -hmm. the rewards that I've, I, I got far outweigh anything from this world. Now for those who are in the industry right now, um, I'd heard it once said that our habitual sins often reveal our wounds that we're living out of those wounds and it's manifesting itself in the form of a sin, which is us trying to grasp onto a perceived good that's kind of medicating a wound that isn't being healed. Um, For those that are maybe in the industry, I I don't know if the finances of it are, you know, giving them a sense of security or it's just the desire to be looked at, the desire to be wanted. Mm -hmm. I I don't imagine Mm -hmm. for most, it's just like, oh, well, it's such a fulfilling industry. I just enjoy the, the physical benefits of it. I, I can't, you know, I can't speak for anybody, but I don't imagine that that's what's keeping them in. Um, for those who are in it, do you think it's the security? Is it the desire to be seen? You know, what is maybe the wound that others might be living out of and it's manifesting in that sin? Or maybe in your case, what was kind of the gateway into that whole industry to start? The gateway was um, someone recruited me and she made it seem really fun. And, um, it was the opportunity to work from home, make my own hours, make like be creative in my own content, um, but also male attention and um, having kind of a sense of power over them. Um, mm-hmm. I was raised in a single parent environment, so I never knew my father. And I think that has a little bit to do with it. Um, then also it's not everybody who makes an extraordinary amount 
of money doing this. Um, I think that's a huge misconception, especially for young girls who think that they can sign up to OnlyFans and just post photos and then suddenly be a millionaire. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into being successful at almost anything, but including pornography. Um, and it's really, there's a lot more to it than just, you know, posting lewd photos. You are, you interact with these people. Um, you, you find ways, you're always listening for ways that you can manipulate these people. Mm. And like I, I say a lot, um, it's not your grandmother's porn anymore. Um, pornography nowadays is interactive. It is destined, it's designed to be addictive, to be hypnotic. And so you really have to be quite devious and very narcissistic in order to succeed. Um, and I, I think another thing maybe for women um, who've done this, who were in, are in the industry and have been for a while is you start to think like that you can't do anything else. Either maybe on one hand, you're not worthy of doing anything else, which is just really tragic. And then also, like for me, um, I was in the industry for about 10 years, and now I'm trying to get out. Um, do I even know like how to work at a regular job? And then, um, and who's going to hire me based on my past? Like, let's even take the financial aspect completely out of it, because there's no way that I'm going to you know, find a job where I work from home and make my own hours and make that much money. Um, but who's going to hire me just based on my resume? What have I been doing for the last 10 years? You know, even if I put something like artistic entertainer, um, that's just going to lead to more questions. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that's a struggle. And, um, and for me, even like throughout the last 10 years, there were times when I didn't want to do it anymore um, because I felt like what I was doing was kind of on the verge of unethical, but I just wouldn't think about it. I'd push it out of my mind and I, I'd say, you know, I'm just not going to think about this right now. Um, and, and I think that's really a trick that, you know, us as humans have, um, have, you know, learned to do really well as just pushing something out of our mind that we don't want to think about. Mm -hmm. um, and then having faith that everything's going to be okay. Uh, that's really, really hard. And I completely understand that. And I can empathize with people in that respect because it's difficult to put your hands in, I mean, to put your life in someone else's hands. Um, especially maybe somebody that you don't have a, a relationship with yet, but I really encourage everyone, please, try just try to have a relationship with God because he wants a relationship with you and um you know maybe there are a lot of people who are skeptical of my story and I say that you know good for you a healthy dose of skepticism is is really important um but what I'm saying it's not it's not an act um I am his and he is mine and I'm so so glad for it I'm so glad that he never gave up on me. That he was he's always been there. He's always been there waiting for me. And now that that I'm here um now that I'm where I'm at now, um I only go see my therapist once a month now. Um I've made peace with my tragedy. I uh I have people, you know, like St. Clair in my life and and like you, Jason Everett. Um like I just feel so blessed, so lucky, and um, and I encourage others just to just to try. Yeah, no, I mean it's a beautiful story that that you're able to have such compassion on yourself, you know, when others aren't exercising that. Because to to reflect is, is that young girl with no dad. There's an inevitable sense of vulnerability in that place and a desire for control and safety and power. And I mean, what you want is safety. And, and you see, I get safety through power. And, and this industry, in a sense, is offering you a sense of power 
over men, power over your situation and Precisely. security. And it's, it's, but th this is the way the devil works. He, you know, he promises you everything and then he gives you nothing. And so, Hey, you know, come, come with me. And then I'm going to give you this power. And it comes in the form of handcuffs of just slavery of, of like, here's your power. Mm -hmm. And, and so th that's yeah. always the promise is like you, you come with me, you'll have power. When in the reality, the most powerful thing we could do is the will of God. And so now you have so much more power than you've ha ever had in your life in terms of not only just your self agency, yeah. but your vulnerability and trust in God of realizing he's the one yeah. who has control over my life, not me. And there's power in that yeah. ultimate surrender. And so, you know, so, okay. so much of this is just a legitimate wound that has a legitimate need that the devil tries to intercept with the false promises. And then we buy it and then we justify it. Well, it's not like I'm doing this. It's not like I'm doing that. And then exactly. we sell ourselves. I remember seeing, hearing some analogy. I think it was from a Jewish rabbi that when we commit a sin, it's almost like a bird selling his feather for something. And you can give one away. You can still fly. And then, you know, another one goes out and then I can still fly. I mean, not as fast, but I still got the feathers. And eventually there comes a point where you can't even leave the ground. And I think that's where he wants you to get in that point of just feeling a hostage to sin. And it's just like, there's no way out of here. But at that point is when you cry out to God of, of, of help me in today's readings at mass where the Canaanite woman where Jesus goes to Tyre and Sidon and the woman comes, hey, you know, and, and have pity on me. My, my daughter has a demon. And it's a remarkable gospel, gospel patch. It's like Jesus doesn't even say anything to her. And this is like hard to, mm -hmm. to wrestle with because you imagine like this nice Jesus, like this Jonathan Rumi Jesus, totally just mm -hmm. ignoring this woman with a possessed kid. And he just he just totally ignores her. And she's like, you know, so she goes to the apostles and they ignore her. And because he, they say to Jesus, like she keeps bugging us, like meaning he, she didn't ask the apostles once or twice, probably three times, four times to the point where like she, she's legit on their nerves. And so now she's at the point of racking up five rejections from men. And then the apostles ask Jesus and he says no again, which is like rejection number six. You know, it's not right to throw the, you know, the, the food that belongs to the kids or the dogs. And then she petitions again, you know, but even the dogs, you know, she says, please help me. And he said, no. And then he rejects her again with a dog comment. And so she's up to like eight rejections at this point. And then she says, but even the dogs eat the food that falls. And you read this and it's like, why did she have to go through all of that? And I think part of it may have been for her to be affirmed in her faith, but I think a lot of it was for the apostles that Jesus wanted mm. them to see the power of perseverance when you feel that God is not even listening yeah. to you. He's comparing you to a dog. And it's like, what? It, it's really hard mm -hmm. to wrap your mind around this thing. But, you know, I see yeah. in you this, 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 this perseverance of trusting the heart of the father that he's going to come through when you're in an absolute state of pity. Mm -hmm. Precisely. Um, and I'm not, I'm not to the point yet where I'm like, I'm, so grateful that this tragedy happened and so then that's how i got to the catholic church like i'm i'm not there yet mm -hmm. uh, i don't think i ever will be but i am at the point where i now have a wonderful relationship um with him with our mother with the saints and i am at the point where i can see the potential good of um of what happened to me and how he used that perhaps to get me into the Catholic church and back into a relationship with him. And, um, you know, I always say like, it's, it's, uh, it's not really my place to ask, why did you do this? And it's not my place really to hypothesize or anything. Mm -hmm. And I'll never really know, um, until I, I meet with him. Um, ideally. And, and at that point, I won't care. Because at that point, um, everything, you know, I'll, I'll be in the kingdom of paradise. And, mm. um, and so, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna say like, I'm so glad that this happened to me and, and everything. And mm -hmm. I, I often say, you know, my life isn't like a Disney princess movie, where it was like, wham, bam, yay, I'm, grateful for that and it led me here but at the same time I'm starting to see um the potential and the good that can come of such tragedy 
Yeah. And I think what's so healthy about your story is that it isn't just like, hey, I'm the victim of the porn industry. I'm the victim of a broken family. I'm the victim of this. I'm the, like, you're, you, you own it of just like, look, I manipulated guys. I, I use guys, you know, financial gain, emotional gain, psychological gain. Like, but then you come to a point of exhaustion of just like, I'm not only just tired of being used by guys, I'm, I'm tired of manipulating them in this narcissistic way to get supply from them to, to feed my, my, my sense of how much shame and woundedness I have. And so I think that's yeah. balanced, but I think that you also deserve apologies yourself. And what I mean by that is like, you know, I grew up in high school looking at pornography. And so I, I feel like you deserve to hear that, you know, I'm sorry. Like, I never looked at you specifically, but I, I looked at these women in an objectifying way. And, and I hope that you've heard from men. And if not, you need to hear from me that I'm sorry. And I ask your forgiveness for the times that I've looked at, at my sisters in humanity as some collection of body parts back in junior high and high school. And granted, you know, I haven't looked at it since then. But, I, you know, I feel a debt of just needing to apologize that, you know, this is not a one sided street here. Like porn doesn't exist unless there's another person on the other side of the screen swiping a credit card mm -hmm. or whatever. You know, and grand back mm -hmm. then I didn't have a credit card, but I managed to find the junk. And so I, I just yeah. hope that you hear from me and, and from other men that we're sorry for the role that we've played in prostituting the daughters of God by our own lust. And so. I hope you've heard that. And if not, please hear it from me. I ask your forgiveness and I'm sorry too. I forgive you, Jason. And I have heard it actually, um, not only from just random men um, who are in you know, your situation, who looked at pornography, but even from my previous clients, um, they've come to me and, and said, you know, there's, there's one in particular that, because I mean, maybe I should also explain it, it's not like, I mean, I did, I made videos and, um, and people would anonymously buy them, but also what pornography is now is it's, it can be a relationship. Um, I did, you know, Skype sessions with these men once a week. So basically like we got to know each other really well. And, um, I had one, I've had one in particular who said, you know, on one hand, I'm really still so upset by by what you did to me. But on the other hand, I'm so grateful that you were able to be in a place where you are now and get there. And and that means so much to me. And I'm still I still find it, I don't know, kind of difficult to accept an apology from people like you because I think I'm the one who objectified them. Um and and I do I I do accept apologies with grace and love, and I think that that's amazing. But at the same time, I still feel like I'm the one who really went the extra mile to to objectify them, to cause them to become like more and more addicted to me and my content, because truly, in every single interaction that I had with these men, it was always in the back of my mind, like, okay, take note of what they're saying. So you can use that later, mm. use that to your advantage. Um, and you know, I, I took a psychology course just so that I could start to learn more about how to manipulate people. Um, I studied like Stockholm syndrome, uh, techniques, Nazi techniques, like, I, I went pretty deep um, in order to really figure out, like kind of translate what they're saying and what they're not saying. And it's and always mm. the bottom line is how I can use this to my advantage. And a lot of times when they would get kind of wishy-washy and want to leave, I would bring up these other things. Like, you really think that you can live a life without me, without your goddess? And you can't. Um, I I really really truly manipulated these men and on the on the flip side of course yes they are paying for it there's there's you know there were plenty of times that they would just shut off communication and i would still like, try and try and try and get and um and so it, it's not entirely on me you know they were kind of in a way i guess asking for it i don't know for lack of a better term um, or literally, in some cases, asking to be manipulated, to be humiliated. Hmm. Um, 
And so I think that the burden is is on both of us, but I really feel like the majority of the burden was on me because um, it's harder to make smart decisions, I guess, you know, when, you know, most of the blood in your body is not, is not in your head, you know, and you're super turned on and you're looking at a woman who um, is dressed in dressed lingerie and, and I don't think that there was like a level um, playing field, you know, <laughs> like I, I really feel like I had the advantage there and I could have stopped them at certain points when I knew that it was taking them, I was, I was pushing them over the edge. And, um, and so that's, you know, knowing that now, um, maybe it makes it a little bit easier for you to understand why, um, I'm okay with people on social media saying bad things to me because, Mm -hmm. um, technically, you know, I did those things. I was that person. I was a horrible, horrible individual who really just, um, I brought a lot of pain and misery to people's lives, I think. Um, and if I didn't, like, thank God that they were they were able to separate, you know, reality from fantasy and and that they're they're no longer at least getting it from me. But um, you know, I pray also quite often for for those that I interacted with and that they could get out of, of this rut or this, you know, cycle that they're in. Yeah, and you know, and as you mentioned that, what what comes to mind for me is that what the evil one's trying to do is demonize the gift of empathy that God has given to women this feminine genius to perceive the hurt, the needs of others. But it's a demonization of that gift by taking trauma and and using trauma bonding to manipulate the other person mm-hmm. for their own gain. And so, like, there's a legit yeah. gift from the father to his daughters. And when she's living out of these places of woundedness, you know, it's taking that empathy, seeing the need, and then bringing evil into their lives. But I think the beauty of the redemption is that the core of the gift remains, that if God has given you this profound gift of intuition into another person's hurts and and their needs, and maybe for some of these guys, it was a mother wound, you know, a shame or whatever, and you perceive that need. And but now with Christ, you can actually go into those wounds in a sense of sense them. But instead of making a doorway to the to demonic possession and evil and oppression and all that other stuff, it, it, it's a doorway to grace of like, I can see the need mm-hmm. in the poor or in this person or in that person. And I, I can respond with love, not to get something out of them, but to give something to mm-hmm. them. And so I think the beauty is that yeah, that's God can baptize all of these things. <laughs> like these things can be baptized. They can be made pure instead of throwing the baby out with the bathwater of just like, you need to go live in the desert, you know, as a hermitist for the rest of your life. It's like, no, no, no. There, there are legit gifts that the father gave me that I misused of empathy, of beauty, of this, of that, of intuition. And these can be redeemed by Christ and they must be for the building up of the kingdom of God. So hopefully you've been able to see that, that these gifts you still possess can now be used in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I completely disagree with is on social media is when somebody tells me that I'm, I'm too far gone, um, that, that no man will ever love me, especially Jesus. And, and that's the only time that I say, wait, 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 stop right there. Like his love, his mercy, his forgiveness. It's not something that I've earned. It's not something I deserve. I'm not worthy of it. None of us are. It's something I choose and I choose to be his and I choose for him to be mine. I choose this relationship. I choose his mercy and his forgiveness and no one is too far gone. Nobody, not a single person out there is too far gone to be redeemed by Christ. That's the, that's the only thing I really strongly object to. Yeah, but I mean, when you hear such objections, I think hopefully it stirs in you pity because, you know, the first thing that strikes me if someone says that, they obviously haven't v- gone very deep into their own <laughs> consciousness mm-hmm. in, in terms of the, the deep depths of knowing that they're loved by the Father. Because if they haven't yeah. encountered the love of the Father, 
obviously they're going to have suspicion as to the depths of that love. Whereas if they've, you know, plumbed the depths of their own consciousness and realized like, wow, I'm a wretched, miserable human being and God truly loves me, man, if he can love me, he can love anybody like that. That's conversion. Exactly. And so if somebody's saying, no, 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 yeah. you're, you're beyond the pale. Like, you know, oh, we're kind of bad, but you're really bad. And so that's the crucifix. Yeah. This wasn't quite enough to pay your price, just mine. So. Yeah. I always wonder, I'm like, what church do you go to? <laughs> you learned that. And like, have you never heard of Mary Magdalene or like any of the people in the Bible who are just wretched, horrible sinners? And yeah, St. Mary of Egypt, perhaps. In... <laughs> right. Yeah, I, I don't know. Are you familiar? I imagine with the story of St. Mary of Egypt. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> I wasn't before this, but a lot of people um, suggest that I consecrate myself to her, and I've I've learned her story. Um, and I think it's beautiful, certainly. Would you I mind just, sharing it really for those who haven't? It. Would you mind sharing it for those who have not heard it? Um, because I know some people are like, so, who's Mary of Egypt? She's a, um, an Eastern Orthodox saint. Um, she's, so she's more known in like the Byzantine Catholics. And um, she was someone who really enjoyed having sex. And in almost a narcissistic kind of way where she would um, seduce, you know, other wives, men, no, other men's, no, other, <laughs> she would seduce husbands yeah. of other women. Yeah. And um, sorry, I'm still <laughs> I'm recovering from a cold, so I'm kind of okay. like space. Oh, you're good. Um, uh, so she would seduce anybody um, who would give her the time of day or even, you know, those who wouldn't she really enjoyed the narcissistic aspects of male attention and she really enjoyed having sex and she went through her life like this for a while and then at one point um but she was still going to church um i think kind of similar to me where um you know she didn't think that one thing had to do with with the other um like prior to my tragedy i I would go to church, a, a Lutheran church. And, um, and I never really thought that, you know, my actions had anything to do with God. Um, and, and I know a lot of that is like Martin Luther's teachings of, mm -hmm. you know, you can do whatever you want and he'll cover it with snow. Um, so, but then at one point she went to go into the church and she was restricted, um, physically, there was nothing there, no physical, barrier but she was not able to walk in she kept trying and she kept trying to get in and trying to get in and finally she just um collapsed and and determined that you know that this was the point where she had to examine her life this was her um kind of under the fig tree moment kind of her um her own tragedy where it was like wait a minute, something is happening here that's preventing me from going into the church. And there's a reason for that. Um, and then I'm kind of sketchy on the details as to what happened then. But then, um, but she, she decided that it was the Lord preventing her from going into the church because she needs to look at herself and her actions. And so after she did that, she realized and now that I'm saying this, I'm like, yeah, it does really relate to my story. Um, and so after she looked at herself and her actions, her behavior, she realized that she didn't like what she saw and that she truly was um, just a, a wretched sinner. And she really wanted to change. And so then I believe it was after she had those thoughts, she was able to go into the church. Mm -hmm. and like physically walk into the church and for that she was so extremely grateful that she decided to dedicate the rest of her life um just to being a hermit a nomad in the in the desert just um wandering and to the point of starvation um she you know was really poorly clothed really malnourished and um and then it was a particular desert father who found her and I can't remember his name but found her and then gave her um stuff to wear stuff to eat and through him she really was able to live a life of um of penitence 
but not so much like I'm a horrible human being who doesn't deserve to eat or or wear clothing in the desert. Um, it was more, um, I I can be redeemed and I can be someone who is a witness to others. I think that's the gist of it. <laughs> yeah, and I'd heard of another saint. I forget her name. Maybe people watching can leave it in the comments section if they know. But she was in like a convent. Like she was a full-blown nun and everything and had an affair, was promiscuous, you know, fornicated, left the convent. So it's like, okay, crash and burn and became a prostitute. And then her uncle, I think, who was a monk, came and eventually found, you know, what brothel that she was at and was able to convince her to come back to the religious life. And she had a reconversion, became a sister again, mm -hmm. and then canonized. And it's like, so people who look down upon you or St. Mary of Egypt or whatever, I mean, if these people get to heaven, mm -hmm. they're going to be like, uh, how'd you get it here? But I, what I tend to think <laughs> yeah. of is is what what purgation and purification those judgmental individuals are in need of themselves before they mm -hmm. can get to heaven and be able to be comfortable mm -hmm. with those who weren't quite as perfect as they were. But, yeah. I, you know, I just want to thank you for your courage and persevering in your witness and in mm -hmm. your intercession for your former clients, for all people that are in bondage to the entire industry, for these poor girls who think they're going to make it big enslaving themselves on only fans for $40 a month or whatever they're cashing in at the end of the month. Mm -hmm. that, that This is all empty false yeah. promises. I mean, even if mm -hmm. she were to be getting a, a billion dollars, I mean, she's getting ripped off. I, I mean, any woman mm -hmm. at a strip club, any woman on only fans, if she's making six, seven, eight figures a, a week on that, she's getting ripped off. I mean, the only thing I think that could pay the price to even see that much of a woman is a wedding ring. Like that, that's, that's the only currency that can be possibly exchanged is the gift of an entire other human being that's priceless. And, and so at the end of the day, I think we've just got to pray that these women would, and men that are involved in it would realize how much they're getting ripped off and how much worth they have. Mm -hmm. Because I think of the depth of it is a deep belief, not in your, in your value, but in your worthlessness. And I know in narcissism, it's got this false mm -hmm. idea that these people think they're just so fantastic and I'm the best in the world. That's not narcissism. Mm -hmm. I mean, narcissism is a, is a deep shame of sense of like, I am not valuable. And so I need to garner as much narcissistic supply as I can possibly get because I can't bear to live with my own shame. And so these yeah. people that are trapped, it's not because they think they're so valuable, but because they, 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 I think they sense a, a lack of value in their lives. I would imagine you'd probably concur with that. Definitely. Um, and I think something else that's really plaguing our society and those men and women who are addicted to pornography is, um, you know, I'd like to say to them that um, it's not your fault. Like, look everywhere. The pornification of our civilization is everywhere. Um, the average age that a, that a, usually a boy, um, but also girls see pornography for the first time is eight years old. Oof. What are you supposed to make of that? Yeah. And so it's not your fault. And also, um, it's completely understandable that you would that you would get sucked into this as an addiction. Um, it feels good. It's something that you can control. Uh, you know, the serotonin in your mind, your brain chemistry actually starts to change after a while. It's like a drug and, and you're not accepted, you know, in civilization or you have trouble dating or, or any of these different things. And you turn to something that makes you feel good. And so it's completely understandable and, and it's not shameful. Um, I wish more people would understand that they're not alone. Um, it's not something to be ashamed of um, because it's not entirely their fault. Uh, porn is everywhere, like TV commercials, music on the radio. Um, it's just always in your face. And and then especially for, for those women who are still in the industry, you know, I'd like to say that you're worth more than this. Um, you may think that it's empowering. You may think that, you know, what you're doing, it, you're like this total hotshot and, and you've got it all together. But you're, you're made in the image of God and you're worth more than just, you know, a moment of lust. And um, 
and I'd like to encourage anybody, uh, if, if you're struggling with any of these things, please reach out. There are a lot of resources out there and I guarantee that it, it's going to be hard just like any quitting any other addiction. Um, but in the long run, it's completely worth it. I, I remember years ago when I lived in San Diego, I'd sometimes drive to Home Depot for little home projects and a building or whatever. And I'd pass this little town of Lemon Grove and under this freeway overpass was a strip club, uh, you know, just maybe a mile away from this Home Depot. And every time I'd drive by, often there'd be, you know, some of their performers kind of just sitting kind of off of the side of the building on this picnic table, having a cigarette or whatever, you know, and I would just drive by and kind of just say a Hail Mary and keep going. Um, but, you know, God put it on my heart that, you know, one of these days you need to actually go talk to them and and try to you know show them the love of Christ, not just pray as you're going by at 50 miles an hour. And I remember one day I was coming back from Home Depot and I just felt like God saying, go today. And I'm like, nope, no, <laughs> no, not happening. Thanks. No, I'll, I'll do a decade today. But like God was like, go uh -huh. now. And it was just like this. Uh, and so I, I had this little deal with God. I'm like, God, okay, I'm not pulling over unless uh, I got something to give them. Cause like, I don't know, I'll just pull up and just start a random conversation. Yeah. Um, and I look yeah. over and like behind the passenger seat of the car was one copy of one of our chastity books. And I'm like, Oh, great. And then I said, okay, but I'm not pulling over unless there's only one woman out there. Cause I don't want some like big scene security guards and all that stuff. And, and just some pass it, I look over and there's one woman sitting outside and I've got one chastity book sitting here. I'm like, okay, I'm like, I'll, I'll do it. So I kind of hit the blink and I pull over it into the median area. And I'm like, what if I get in a car accident? You know, like chastity speaker gets rear-ended in strip club parking lot. I'm like, this is like real bad for PR. <laughs> um, but I'm like, okay, God, if you call, you'll, you'll do it. And so, you know, I drive in and I pulled right up the, you know, picnic table where she was kind of sitting on having a smoke. And and I, I, I kind of rolled down the window and, you know, and I kind of said hello. And she came right over to the car and I said, um, you know, and I gave her the book and I looked into her eyes. And it was like, they were like charcoal. Like it was like no one had even looked into this woman's eyes for a decade yeah. because they were so busy gawking at her form. And so, you know, I just gave her a book and I said, this little book did on, you know, how, how to start over. And, you know, and I just, you know, said some encouraging or kind things to her. And, and she was, you know, really grateful. And, and she took the book and I, and I left and, you know, prayed for her on the way home. And I'd invite anybody listening to pray for her as well. But to me, it was almost like she hadn't been seen in so long. And it, it, mm -hmm. it seems like the, the porn star is the center of all the attention, but she's completely ignored in the process. It's all about his needs, his demands, his wants, his whatever. And yes, yep. so much of her is shown, but she's not revealed in the least. And so I think that's mm -hmm. that the fuel of the whole porn industry is how much of the woman it hides, because if it showed mm -hmm. the full woman, the industry would implode overnight because it's too much to see a full woman. And so we just have to reduce her to a collection of body parts and then it's consumable because I can't fit into my heart, her, her trauma, her background, her story. It's just too much. And so I think, you know, the right. whole solution to porn is to show the full woman and to allow her actually to be seen. And in the end, I think that's what she mm -hmm. did for as well. So, but mm -hmm. yeah. my two it's for you, <laughs> but um, <laughs> uh, in closing, uh, how could people get in touch with the work that you're doing? You know, any stuff that you're sharing on social media or supporting you, um, any things that you'd want to share that we can put down in the show notes? Certainly. Um, people can find me on Instagram and Twitter. If you just search miss B converted. Um, and then I also have an email address. I, I love receiving messages from people who are either, struggling or you know i've i've actually received quite a few messages from people who are similar to me who left the industry and are now just super grateful to be where they are it's miss b converted at gmail.com um you know send me your hate mail send me your photos of your dogs um i love to receive anything and everything that anyone would like to share with me and um I I talked about, you know, being nervous about getting a real job and I I put that in quotes, real job. Um, and I still don't actually have a real job yet. Um, but I'm currently um making rosaries and other Catholic jewelry. Um and the support has just been absolutely tremendous. I'm blown away uh on a daily basis for people who contact me 
who want, you know, a custom rosary for their child's first communion or um, a priest who just graduated from seminary. And for people to request that me, um, a former porn star with my background, that they want me to make a rosary for their daughter, like I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. Um, and you can find my stuff on Etsy. Uh, the Etsy page is Ave Maria Every Day. Dot Etsy dot com and um, and just anything I'd like to be there um, to help I'd like to be there to be a witness um, just to listen I've had several people reach out who are you know still in the throes of addiction and um, if you just need someone to listen to I'm I'm there and it's my way of of giving back but also um, you know, I say it's not entirely altruistic because when people ask me for help, it helps me to get out of the hamster wheel that is my mind. You know, if I'm in the throes of, oh, goodness, my life, or blah, 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 um, I can pray and, and that works tremendously. But really, the secret is um, being of service to somebody else. So I, I gladly welcome any and all comments. Oh, that's awesome. And again, the email is M-I-S-S, then the letter B converted at... Correct. Okay. And so... Gmail. Uh, yep, you yeah, got it. So feel free to reach her there. But again, no hate mail. I'm going to say no. If you are the grumpy prodigal son's brother and you are standing outside the party, uh, you need to just get over yourself. Come on in. We slaughtered the fatted calf. We're having a big party. It's going to be great. So so no no cranky <laughs> <Thank> emails. <you. laughs> yeah, absolutely. We will not tolerate that. Uh, you're not going to spoil the party. So right. God bless you. And again, right. thank you for coming on the podcast. Keep oh, up the great you. work. Thank you so much. You're welcome.